a lot of this kind of education and training about careers in international law. Because the reality is, 30 years ago, someone you know, might be able to walk into a law office, say, hey, I'm willing to volunteer for that two-year gig in Brussels and end up as the company's international lawyer. That doesn't happen anymore. That's not how international law works anymore. Um, so we are going to talk about the different styles and methods of getting a career in international law, and specifically what you can do now, while you are still in law school, to pursue this career. Because in reality, and I know you've heard this in other places because I developed the framework for this while I was actually working here, um, the reality is that if you wait till you graduate or six months before you graduate to start preparing for your career, you're too late. Now, you can do it. It's not, don't throw your hands up and say, oh no, I'm a 3L, I graduate in, in four months, it's too late. It's not. But odds of you finding something the moment you walk out of law school in international law are difficult. So we're going to talk about the things that you can be working on now while you're in law school to prepare yourself for that career. So the first things we're going to look at um, over the course, we're going to look at skills of what you can work on. We're going to start with languages, and I'm going to touch on that briefly because Pitt is, and I kid you not, I've been around this country talking at law schools from UCLA to Boston. Pitt has one of the best language programs in the country for law students bar none, without a doubt. I talk about some of the options that are out there, and they're like, where is that? And I was like, well, that's at Pitt. And they're like, that's amazing. How in the world do they do that? So you have the best home for languages for lawyers that you can ever want. But we'll talk about building your resume, and we'll talk about networking. So really briefly, when it comes to languages, and when it comes to pursuing a career in international law, the first thing that I'll mention is, if you don't have a language skill, don't feel like you have to have one to work in international law. There are jobs out there that do not require a foreign language skill in order to pursue an international law job. That said, it opens up a number of doors that are just not available to you otherwise. So the ability to speak and write in another language is incredibly valuable in your job search. Now, we're not talking about going to the grocery store, talking to the bus driver, talking to the po folks on the street. We're talking about professional language skills, which is why it's really important. If you have a pre-existing language skill, don't do what I did, be nearly fluent in Spanish, and then all of a sudden go to college and like, oh, I want to learn German, and then not be good at either of them. Pick a language, stick with it. It is far more valuable to have professional fluency in one language than it is to be able to say, hi, hello, how are you, and carry on a conversation in three. Because if you're going to use this to get a job, they don't care if you can say, hi, hello, how are you, and carry on a conversation. They care, can you read technical legal documents in this language? Can you write technical legal documents in this language? Can you give a legal presentation? Can you represent someone in court? Can you represent your client at the appellate level in this language? So the professional skill is what you need to be shooting for. Now, you have language for lawyers classes here at the law school that you can take. You also have uses, which has oodles and oodles of language opportunities there. You've got the, um, what's the, the, the FLAS fellowships, the Foreign Language Area Studies fellowships, which will not only pay for your law school tuition and give you a stipend, but if you apply for the summer ones, will get you overseas to learn language in country or to a cultural, uh, culturally appropriate training station for languages. So take advantage of those opportunities while you're here at law school. There are quite a number of Pitt law grads that I work with a lot down in DC who are in their government or international organization positions because of the language skills that they developed while they were here at Pitt. And it just set them apart so much. One of my former students when I was still here became professionally fluent in Quechua, which is the indigenous language in, for a large portion of Latin America. Incredibly rare to find lawyers that actually have that level of skill in Quechua. So she was able to walk into an indigenous rights job pretty much out of law school because she set herself apart in a very unique way. Pre-existing skills develop them into a professional level of competency. If you know you want to work in a certain area, if you know Latin America is the place for me, then you'd better be studying Portuguese, Spanish, or Quechua, maybe French. There are like two countries, but the OAS actually lists it as a, uh, a language of interest for the Organization of American States. But know your languages. Know what's important. If you're really focused on Africa, yes, Kiswahili is really good. 
but so is French because of the Francophone uh, African countries. So make sure you look into the geographic area that you have an interest in when you're picking where you want to or what you want to spend your time on. Uh, area of need based on subject matter interests. So if you're interested in national security on a global level, probably Farsi and Arabic are really good languages for you to pick up. There are always a few topics, a few subject areas that are focused on specific geographic regions. Before my generation, you know, back when Eileen first got started in USIS, Russian language skills were where everyone that wanted to do international relations, that's what you studied because it was the Cold War. Now, we actually haven't had several generations of students that have taken Russian and the State Department is scrambling for people in the younger levels that have Russian language skills because it's obviously an area of concern. China, huge. International trade, international economics, international develop. Chinese, massively valuable in those fields. So if you have a specific subject area, look around. Find out if there are some jobs that have language requirements in that field that you want to focus on. Um, and certainly areas of job availability. If you're willing to live outside of the United States, look around for where those jobs might be available. Having someone who speaks the local language when you're doing mental disability law in Hungary can be very, very valuable. Um, so know things like where you are likely to be placed. For example, the United Nations uh, Environment Program, the United Nations Development Fund are both based out of Nairobi. Having the ability to speak Kiswahili when you're based in Nairobi as a legal officer for the United Nations Environmental Program, very valuable. Um, knowing that kind of stuff, important. We'll talk about how you learn those things, um, but first we're going to, and the way you learn that is by looking at job descriptions. So, if you are not now, all right, let me start with this. Not internships or fellowships. Not looking for a summer placement. How many of you have pulled down and looked at job descriptions for a career that you want after law school? So we've got two, all right? Well, Andrew, you don't count. <laughs> um, this is by far, this is, this is your stock in trade in getting a job. You need to understand how job descriptions work. Just like reading a case in a case book, it takes skills to decipher what a job description is actually asking for. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, in the legal community, um, especially in the nonprofit government and international organization sectors, um, not so much in the big law firm private practice sectors because they actually have enough money to employ human resources people, but in the smaller ones or the government or international organization ones, usually the lawyers end up writing the job descriptions. Lawyers hate writing job descriptions. We make the rules about what you can include based on employment law and discrimination law and stuff like that, but we actually hate writing them. That means most lawyers are really, really bad at writing job descriptions. They only do it when they absolutely have to, and they want to put stuff in there that they can't because we made the rules that say what you can and can't put in, but we don't like those. Um, which means job descriptions can be confusing. They can be a morass of unclear, unexplicit, and sometimes intentionally uh, cloudy terms. The only way to get better at understanding what a job description is actually asking for is to read lots of them. And when I say lots, I mean if you're deciding, I want to do international environmental law for an international organization. I want to work for the UN. I want to work for the World Health Organization. I want to work for something like that. You would better have 20 or 25 different job descriptions that you've downloaded and have read and have looked at enough that you are comfortable with the terminology. And we'll get into why that's really important now. But I cannot overemphasize the need for you to download and study job descriptions. And don't just put the links in. I had one of my, uh, actually a fellow who worked for me who should have known better, um, but came back to me and said, so I went to my list of all the links to the job descriptions that I was using as my reference points and they had taken them down because the jobs had been filled. I was like, yes, you need to download them, print them off, copy them, paste them into Word, something, get the text because you need to look at these. You need to go back to them. Now, these do not all need to be jobs that you actually want. In fact, it's impossible probably for most of you to find 25 jobs right now that you're like, yes, I would do this for the rest of my life. Um, most lawyers don't actually stay longer than about four to five years in a job anymore. Um, so the cycle of turnover is much faster. And you may not have a very clear sense of what you want to do. That's not uncommon at all, and nor do you have to. But you need to be looking at 20 to 25 jobs that are at least related to the field that you're interested in so you can go off of them. Every job description will have these three things. They may not call them this, 
And some of them may have one entry that checks the box on this, but it will have these three categories. It will have qualifications, it will have skills, and it will have experience requirements. All, every single job description will have this. All right. Um, so we're going to look at a sample job description. This is a job that was available earlier, well, last year actually, late last year, um, that was up on the website for someone to apply to. One of the reasons I'm pulling this up is it's one that definitely could have been applied to by someone who had some experience but was relatively recent out of law school. It's Senior Researcher, Rule of Law Program, the Hague Institute for Global Justice. And I'll, I'll give these slides to Austin so you can get them from Austin afterwards if you want more detail. Um, this job is no longer on the, the website. They filled this position. But when you look at a posting for a job, you always want to make sure that you are actually looking at the details about what it is asking for. Um, make sure that you understand the position. Senior Researcher, Rule of Law Program, Hague Institute. Okay. A couple of things that that tells me right away. I need to investigate the senior because the senior researcher is obviously a qualifying word that says more than researcher. Don't assume that that means it's not okay for me. We'll look at actually how easily someone who's a year or two out of law school could apply for this job to be a senior researcher. Don't assume that senior means seven years of experience or something like that. Two, rule of law program. If I know anything about rule of law, that should give me some hints. If I don't, I need to study up on that a little bit, make sure I understand what the term is. And three, Hague Institute for Global Justice. I'd better know right away, one, either is the Hague Institute in New York and it's just called the Hague Institute, or, and that's not the case, it's in the Hague, which means I need to be willing to work out of the country if I'm going to pursue this job, all right? so. Always look at the details. Now we're going to go through this bit by bit, so you don't have to read all of this on there. Um, but one of the first things when you look at a job description and you actually get past that title and you say, okay, I think this is one that I'd be interested in, read the duties and responsibilities. Sometimes the duties and responsibilities is everything. It's all the qualifications, it's all of the skills, it's all of the experience, and that's unfortunate because then you end up reading all of it. Good job descriptions break out the duties and responsibilities as a separate section. Now, why should you read this? You should read this to make sure you actually want to do this job. You would not believe the number of people I have had get jobs and come to me six months later and say, I hate what I do. Well, did the job description tell you what you would be doing? Yes, but I just thought, you know, senior researcher at Hague Institute, I thought that would be great. Well, read what they actually are going to want you to do. Make sure you understand the obligations of the job and that's okay and that you are okay with them that you are willing to do the work that they want out of this person. Employers do not want someone who is not happy in the position. Employees do not want to be working in a position in which they are unhappy. You are a lose-lose proposition if you don't pay attention to what actually the job is about. So, read the duties and responsibilities. This is as you're looking at Indeed, as you're looking at ASIL's job site, the American Society of International Law has a members only job site. Um, you can log in, look at just international law jobs. As you're looking at them and deciding, do I download this job description? This is what you read. This is what you spend five minutes reading to decide, yes, I'm gonna download this. All right, the first, when you're looking at a job, you've decided, okay, this is a job I, I'm at least interested in. I don't know if I qualified or not yet. I don't know if I would actually apply for this job or not yet but I am at least interested in the job enough to download it. So the first step is, do I have the qualifications? Qualifications may be called any number of things. It may be education requirements, it may be professional skills require, or professional requirements, it may be any number of things. But what it is, in terms of real substance, it's the checkbox items. It's the thing that you look at once and say, yes, they've got that. So it might be, does this person have an MA? Do they have a JD? Do they have a PhD? Do they have an LLM? Whatever it is, it's usually something that you have to have a piece of paper proving you have. If they require someone to be a licensed attorney, you will have, this is where that will be and you will need to make sure you've got this. The reason I say these are checkbox items is this is something that you do once and you never have to worry about again. Once you graduate law school, you will have a JD. You never have to worry about that again. You don't have to continually keep up your JD. Obviously, there, is a few, there are a few exceptions. If you are a practicing lawyer, you need to get CLE to maintain your license, et cetera, et cetera. So there might be some additional requirements, but that goes along with the profession, so you're used to that. Make sure you meet the requirements. This is also one of those areas where this can tell you a lot about the types of jobs. And when I tell you download 20, 25 different job descriptions, it's because you need a statistical base to draw conclusions from. 
So for example, wonderful joint degree, dual degree options here at the law school. You can get a GISPE degree, you can get a graduate public health degree, you can get a uh, MBA, you can, you know, there's oodles of different joint degrees that you can get. Do you need one? I have no idea. I cannot tell you because there are so many international jobs out there that it depends. And the way you decide whether to spend an extra year and an extra $20,000, $30,000 of your money and debt that goes along with that is, boy, when I look at the 25 jobs that I'm interested in, 20 of those 25 jobs want someone with an MA or a MIA or a Master's of International Development or something like that and a JD. I had better go and get that joint degree. Or I really like this you know, international affairs and international development stuff. And I'm looking at the jobs that I want, but only two of the jobs actually actually want someone with a master's. I'm not going to spend my time on that. I'm not going to waste a year and all of that money going after something that the profession doesn't actually expect me to have. It is possible, in fact, potentially even likely, that you will end up going after a job after your first job or your second job that does require an advanced degree. There's no way to predict that though. So don't make decisions now about that unless you know my goal is to be the CEO of a tech startup or something or an entrepreneurial uh, figure in venture capitalism, whatever. Then go and get your MBA because if that's your goal, you know that that's a requirement for that kind of practice area. But if you don't know 20 years from now, I want to be running a Fortune 500 company, then don't go after the MBA unless the jobs that you're looking for actually want someone with it, all right? again. Pulling down a lot of job descriptions gives you a statistical base that you can make reasonable decisions on, rather than guessing. Um, and when I was in law school, I was guessing. Uh, I didn't have this model, I didn't have this system, and it showed. I waffled around a lot of different places and ended up doing stuff that didn't actually help me on the career that I ended up going after. That's not to say that you might not change your mind. In fact, a lot of students work their first job and go, yeah, okay, th that was great, and I'm never doing that again. And that is fine. but. To the extent that you are drawn to a particular area of practice, do the research on that kind of practice, find out what you've got. Um, the other thing I'll mention, and no professors here, all good. Um, you notice how this is, I say, a checkbox item? It's usually one line on the job description. Your degree gets you a graduation from law school. It does not get you a job. Your transcript, your resume, I'm sorry, not your transcript, your resume gets you a job, not your transcript. So to the extent that you have to decide, okay, do I skip class to go listen to this judge of international law that came in from the ICJ and is speaking at my school, or do I study for the exam, then balance that, figure that out. Now I'm not telling you that grades don't matter, they obviously matter, you need to get good grades, all right? But realize that, hey, I've got that what is it, 20% I think you're allowed, of your classes you're allowed to miss um, before you're, you're certified out. Don't miss those because you drank late last night and are hung over and don't want to come into Friday morning classes. Miss those because you're on a trip to go spend a weekend at a student professional skills development conference or you're at the American Society of International Law's annual meeting where there are 1,200 lawyers from around the world talking about international law. Do it for things that are going to make your professional career better. And don't be afraid to say, look, my classes are important, but this is a particular skill that I need and I'm gonna go after that even if it means missing a class, all right? I'm not telling you to ignore your classes, but I am telling you that they are important for one thing and there are other things you need to have. So this is an example um, and unfortunately, and this is a good example of how most job descriptions list it and don't try and read all the details. We're gonna break this out, all right? Um, I see all of you like peering at this. You know, don't read this. This is also a, an example of a bad slide, but it's a bad slide for a reason. Um, there is one line on here that has what the requirements, the qualification requirements for this job are. It says a PhD or JD in public international law, international relations, political sciences, conflict studies, or economics. That is a very, very wide range of qualifications for this job. There is a lot that qualifies you for this position, all right, which is good. From your sense of your perspective, this is great. You know, this means that if I've got a JD and maybe I did the certificate or maybe I just did a whole bunch of studies in international law, I'm good, I'm golden, all right? The more restrictive a job qualification line is, the more difficult it is for you to qualify for it, obviously. So broader ones are fine. Now it does mean more people will probably apply, but it helps you out too. Notice how this is one line 
on this giant slide. There's one entry that talks about qualifications of which you are spending three years right now trying to get. So make sure when you're evaluating how I spend my time during law school that all of it isn't focused on just the JD and you walk out and you don't actually have any of the other stuff that you need because the rest of this page are also things that you have to have for this job and the JD only gets you one of those. Um, the other reason that I've got this up and the reason that I said this is a bad slide is because unfortunately this job doesn't break out qualifications as something separate. It just folds it in. So you may have to do a little dissection of a job description to find where the qualifications are. More and more frequently they're listed separately and, and it's clear to identify, but sometimes you actually have to go digging a little bit. All right. Second thing you will always, 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 always find on a job description, skills. There will be requirements for skills that you need to have. Now, sometimes this can be research and writing. This is the most useless skill on a job description ever because one, how do you prove your research and writing skills? Well, maybe by submitting a seminar paper or a journal article that I turned in. But here's the dirty secret, no one reads those. When you've got 100 applicants for a job, that is not what is going to make or break whether or not I get put in the to interview pile, all right? So it's a very, very tough thing to make a case for I'm the best person to go after because of this skill, except if you're going after a job that has researcher in the title, like the one that we happen to be looking at right now. So you will expect there to be actually quite a lot about research. Now, the good news is because they're asking for someone that they want proof that you're a good researcher, they're actually probably going to be more specific than just research and writing skills. All right. Now, the other trick for this and the other thing that you should be thinking about is your seminar paper. Most times when they ask for research or writing proof, they're not going to let you submit anything you want. They're going to say no more than 10 pages or something like that. All right. Again, know the job you're applying for. If you're applying for an academic job, if you're applying for a researcher job or an analyst job that is expected to write a lot of papers, then you want to submit something that is a good 10 pages of substance, of things that you're proud of, which means write with an idea for your seminar papers of not getting a good grade in the class. Write something that you want to be able to use after you graduate as a tool for your job search. So invest in your seminar classes, invest in your note, invest in your journal article, whatever it may be, write that. Also, and oh, Andrew left, so I'm not kowtowing to Andrew, but write for Jurist. It's a wonderful resource that you at Pitt have right now. Other students are taking advantage of it, but it's also a targeted shorter piece that when you are not applying for a heavy research position, when you're applying for something where they just mention throw in a writing sample, it's a much shorter piece that highlights your writing skills in a non-law review, boring, oh my goodness, this is going on forever, why won't they stop talking kind of way. But Jurist will set you apart as a way that you can say, look, a thousand words. 15, Jur Andrew, what's the, what's the length for a student piece on Jurist nowadays? Um, 1,500 words. 1,500 words is absolutely perfect. Because if I get a job description with a writing sample that is a self-contained 1,500 words, I'll actually read that. I'm not going to read your excerpt of 10 pages from an article where even if I get into it, now I'm pissed that I don't have the rest of the article to read. But I'll read 1,500 words of self-contained content. All right? Write for jurist. Write for your seminar classes as if you were preparing something for your job search, not as if you were writing something for a grade. I mean, you'll get a grade too, but think about what you want. And I, I, I kid you not, be deliberate about how you design your paper with a look for an eight to 10 page section. Write a section that is clearly eight to 10 pages that can be self-contained, that you can add in a paragraph at the front and a paragraph at the end that's a content overview and a, and a summary of the whole paper so that when you cut out half of your paper from your 20 page seminar you know, paper requirement and you submit that to an employer, it actually makes sense. It's coherent. It has a, a, a workable framework that you can rely on. All right. Um, so it could be research and writing. You could also have something like knowledge of comparative legislative drafting on global health issues in small island developing states. This is specific. This is great, except that you will see one job in your entire life that wants someone with this skill. So it's actually useless to you unless you plan to spend 30 years working on this particular topic and are willing to invest in that before you graduate. All right. So you've got to balance the two between hyper specific and way too general. Ideally, what you're looking for are a bunch of different skill requirements 
that you can then turn into something that says, you know what? Comparative legislative drafting and global health. That is a really good skill set because comparative legislative drafting is not policy analyst, anal analysis. It is not legal drafting. It is something different. It is something specialized. It's something I can show that I have skills at. And global health issues. I can write about global health issues in a policy context. I can write about global health issues in a legislative context. I can write about them in an international law context. There are different ways to do that. So I try and identify broader categories of skills that you can go after. And again, sample size is important. This is why I say have 20 or 25 job descriptions. Because if you just look at one or two, it's going to be tough to find the overlap between skills in those different jobs and figure out, boy, when I spend my time, how do I decide what I'm going to write on? How do I decide what I'm going to research and, and you know, prepare myself for? unless I've got a broad view on these are all the different skills and I've boiled this down and I came up with legislative drafting skills or comparative law and global health because the 20 jobs I looked at all had something that touched on it or 18 out of the 20 did or something like that. All right? Again, it takes time. It takes effort. You have to be deliberate about this. But if you do it, you end up with statistically based results that you can say, I know that the jobs I'm going after care about this stuff. I'm willing to spend my time on it. Um, and I should throw in, as always, your career services office is there for a reason. Don't try and do all of this on your own and then make decisions without consulting with someone. Do the work, put the homework in, and then take your results to your career services office person and say, how do I do this? How do I make this decision? Or it's evenly split. It's 50-50. You know, I looked at 25 jobs, and one of them didn't say anything, and 12 said this, and 12 said the exact opposite. How do I decide? Um, so that's where professional help can be very useful. Um, and the, the career services office here, actually I'm doing a training for them tomorrow on how to advise students on international law. They're already good. They were much, they're much better than when I was here. Um, as a student, and they're going to get better too. So take advantage of what they've got. Develop your skills. You can constantly be adding new tools to your professional skill set even while studying. This goes back to the, there's one line on that job that says have a JD. There are a dozen other ones that say have this set of skills, which means during your three years at law school, be working on those skills. Know what you're going after in order to get you ready for that job. When you walk out of law school, it is possible to have a resume that makes you appealing to an employer all right, and to an international one. It's difficult to get a job right at a law school in international law. Most employers want to know they're hiring a good lawyer before they hire a good international lawyer. So often, the wait is about three to five years. You usually need three to five years of real experience to step into a professional level international law job. Don't let that scare you away from international law practice and don't let that make you stop developing the skills that you need. You need to even be working at that time. Um, for example, when I was in law school, uh, when I got bit with the international law bug, which was my second year of law school, I really was like, yeah, okay, this is incredible. I studied abroad for a year. It was wonderful. I said, okay, whatever else my plans were, now I'm doing international criminal law. That's what I'm going to do. Not what I ended up doing, but I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Um, one of the things that I learned really quickly was especially for Americans, because we're not signed up to the International Criminal Court, to the Rome Statute, um, getting a career into international criminal law is difficult. And it does not happen without domestic practice experience. In other words, if you want to be an international criminal lawyer, you'd better do some criminal law. You know where you do criminal law? As a public defender or an assistant district attorney. That's where you do criminal law. That's where you get, or as a defense attorney on the private side. That's where you get the experience. Most international careers have some kind of correlated domestic practice where you can get real good experience preparing for the job that you want. International business transactions, be a contract lawyer for a while. Helps prepare you to no end to deal with those kinds of things. Because if you know contracts cold, then when you're throwing in all of the CISG and uh, Rome statute or uh, uh, Rome convention and New York convention and arbitration and all that stuff on top of it, it's not a big deal because you know contracts cold and now you're just learning one new thing instead of trying to learn all of the new stuff all at the same time. Always be developing your skill sets. All right, what are some of the skills in this job? First one, an entrepreneurial attitude and a demonstrated experience in obtaining funds. All right, right off the bat, this is a non-legal skill. Be prepared, especially for non-law firm jobs, to, for the expectation to be that you are going to have some kind of non-legal skills. Um, 
mainly because lawyers are professionals, which means that nonprofit organizations expect you to do more than just the law part of your job. They expect you to be able to handle running an office, managing a budget, supervising staff, putting a program together, making sure the catering shows up on time. Whatever it might be, they expect that. In this case, raising money for the organization through whatever your work is. How do you get some experience doing that? Actual question for you all. You're in law school right now. How would you go about trying to gain some skill experience in that, you know, something that you can point to? Grant writing? Absolutely. One of the things that you actually, there's a foundation center here in Pittsburgh, which is phenomenal. It offers free classes on grant writing. Um, it's like once a week for six weeks or something like that. They do it every spring and every fall. Um, very valuable skill for lawyers to have because if you end up in the nonprofit world or the NGO world, you are almost always going to have to do some grant writing. There are any number of volunteer organizations here in Pittsburgh that do grant-based projects. Um, there are also oodles and oodles. I mean, the Carnegie's and the, um, uh, what's the other one that's based out of here? There are big foundations. Um, dang, go on. What is it? Mellon. Mellon. Um, and other ones, too, that are based out of Pittsburgh that award significant grants to small organizations here in the city. You can get some experience writing grants, securing funding for an organization. What else? Student organizations. You can, do, you can get funding experience with student organizations right now. Take on a leadership role in the International Law Society. Take on a leadership role in any student organization. It doesn't have to be the international law one. And go get funding. Whether that be a grant or a you know, specific kind of formal funding, or you work with the Institutional Advancement Office here at the law school and you go to a law firm and get them to sponsor a, a dinner or a reception or something that you put on. That kind of stuff is where you can point to and say, I know how to do this. Capacity to manage and embrace the opportunities and challenges of an innovative and growing institution in an international environment. This is useless. This is one of, the, and you will encounter skill descriptions that you look at and you're like, how am I supposed to prove that? What would you write on your resume to prove the capacity to manage and embrace the opportunities and challenges of an innovative and growing institution in international environment? Yeah, you can't. I mean, you can talk that through if you get into an interview, and if they are going to give you some kind of hook, some kind of question to engage on that, maybe you can point to that and say, you know, I've got experience working in a multicultural environment, or I worked with the LLM students a lot when I was at school, or I worked with multicultural uh, high school classes, or, you know, whatever. But you can't put that into a resume in any significant way. Learn, and again, this is why you need to look at a lot of job descriptions and learn what's actually useful and what you don't want to waste your time on. Don't waste your time on something like that that you can't prove. Now let's look at the one under that. Demonstrated experience and affinity with initiating and carrying out international academic policy related research in the field of rule of law. This is fantastic. This is a great skills description because it gives me a lot of different things that I can put into my columns on my spreadsheet as I'm figuring out what skills I go after. So experience and affinity, which is actually really nice because experience is experience, but affinity is just having been exposed to it, having been involved with it in some way. Affinity is basically, I was a student, I was a student organization, I was a research assistant, whatever. Um, it doesn't mean I have work experience. So affinity is a good word. Initiating and carrying out. So designing, implementing, follow through, wrap up, all of that wonderful project terminology, the project development kind of skill sets, all of those very relevant to this job. Carrying out international academic and or policy research. All right? Again, very specific things. Academic research, I'm a research assistant for a professor, I am writing my own paper, I'm writing my note, I'm writing for jurist. Policy research, I'm writing something for the firm or for the nonprofit or for the volunteer organization I work with, all right? Lots of different opportunities for me to demonstrate this skill in the field of rule of law. Now, rule of law is huge these days. It used to be very, very tiny. But now what we compass into rule of law is actually very, very broad. So it actually gives you a lot of leeway. But this is a great skill description and a job description for you to kind of deconstruct and say, what can I get? to prove that I've got these skills, there's a lot that you can do to work towards this now. All right. Um, I'm going to point out, there's a bunch of these other ones here that actually are really good. Um, just to reference uh, knowledge of at least one and preferably two other official languages of the UN, you will see this a lot. Knowledge of one other official language of the UN, knowledge of two other languages of the UN. It's a very good shorthand for international organizations that are like, 
We don't actually care. We'll find a use. If you've got another language, we will find a use for it. We don't care which one it is. Um, you'll see that as a description a lot. So UN languages, official UN languages, there are major and minors of those, um, can be a very good starting point for language study. This one I wanted to go to, though. Demonstrated managerial and interpersonal skills, including a track record of successful project management. Again, non-traditional legal skills, not the kind of thing that you think of, I'm a lawyer, that's what they want me to do, but absolutely the kind of thing that you're going to see in a lot of job descriptions because this is a skill that they expect out of someone who is a professional. This is not a skill that they would expect out of someone who's applying to be an administrative assistant or someone who's applying to be a bookkeeper or any other non-professional gig. You are a professional. There is an expectation of you that you can do more than just the very hyper-specific uh, skill set that you went to school for. And that means you need to work on developing that because unfortunately law school doesn't actually train you to do project management. You need to find other ways to do that. And there are great ways to do that. Become a staffer at Juris. Become a staffer on uh, one of the journals, one of the international law journals or something like that. Organize events for your student organization. Volunteer and get a position with uh, an, a nonprofit organization here in the city. Spend a summer working for an organization where you actually have a project, something that you're in charge of, something that you are responsible for. Right? Always, when you are looking at skills, you want to be thinking, how can I prove this? How can I demonstrate to them that I actually know how to do this? And the best way to do that is to have a resume entry that is either work product or experience based in order to prove this. All right? So be thinking when you're looking at these things, be thinking, how do I get there? How do I get to the point where I can demonstrate that that is true about me? All right. If, um, remember, we looked at this before in terms of figuring out whether you actually are interested in the job. If you get to the skills-based section and it's not helpful, they really don't actually lay out a lot of what they want from the person, you can decipher some of what they want by looking at the duties and responsibilities because that's what they're going to expect you to do on the day-to-day -day job. You should always compare the skills requirements to the duties and responsibilities anyway because this is what they actually want you to do. They may not be doing a good job of conveying what they want in the skills section, but hopefully they will have done a good job of conveying what you're actually going to do. Um, and this is a place where you can go above and beyond. They may have laid out all of the skills, but as you read the duties and responsibilities, you go, what they really want is someone who can do X. And let me show them that in addition to having the skills, I actually understand that they want is someone to do X. And I will demonstrate in my cover letter and in my resume that I can do X, whatever that might be. So again, dive a little deeper, think a little more carefully about what they are asking for, and that helps you craft a job application that makes you stand out. Uh, the last thing that will always be, always, always, always be in a job description is experience. Now, sometimes experience will be just like qualifications, and it will be a one-line entry, and it will say, you must have five to seven years in the field. And you can't argue with that. That's, a, that's what it is. Um, sometimes it will be experience doing this, experience doing that, experience doing this, and then you have to evaluate very carefully, do I actually have that experience? Sometimes they will put numbers on those requirements and sometimes they won't. You have to learn, there are two different kinds of experience in a job description. You have to learn when they are asking for time in position, which means I actually want someone who has done this job for five years. I don't want someone who just happens to have accumulated experience on a different level. I want someone who day in and day out has worked at this position for five years. Or do they mean I want someone who knows how to do X and I assume that anyone who has done this job for three years knows how to do X. Because if that's what they mean, then you have a very good chance of demonstrating to them that you're a good candidate for this job, even though you haven't done the job for three years, because you can say, I know how to do this. And I know you want three years of experience, but you want three years of experience because you want an employee who can handle complex policy research on comparative legislation. Well, let me show you how I know how to do complex policy research on comparative legislation. And they get so wowed by that that they ignore the three years. So there is a difference between time and position and shorthand for skills. Now, again, this is something that takes discernment. It takes time to learn how to recognize when one asks for that and when doesn't. Um, while you are learning, the best tool for you to figure out 
whether this is one of the time in position or one of the shorthand for skills, is your professional network. And we're gonna to touch on professional network later. I'm running out of time. Um, and I know I'm talking really fast and I apologize for that, but they're recording it. So you can go back and watch this later. Um, some of this will be something that you talk through with your mentors. You talk through with your professional contacts and get their input on why and what they put into the, the, uh, the experience section and how you come out on that. Um, Learn to recognize the difference between the two. Use volunteer opportunities, student organizations, professional associations, summer and semester internships as a way to build experience similar to job descriptions you want to pursue. Remember how I said, you know, your, your JD is one line on the job description. Be careful about how you think about what your law school experience is. Um, one of the, when I was still here advising students that wanted to do international law, one of my students came in and said, I want to do something at the ICTR. I want to work for the UN. I want experience in you know, one of their organizations. And he said, the problem is they want three months minimum commitment for, or I'm sorry, they want six months minimum commitment for an internship. That would mean skipping the fall semester. If I start in June, they're going to want me until December. And I said, what, why is there a question here? If you want to work for the UN, take a semester off, go work for the UN in Rwanda, have six months of experience on your resume, and come back. It turns out, when he finished, he had to do spring semester and then a fall semester. So he bumped his graduation by a semester. One, don't worry about delaying your graduation. In fact, more and more law students have more experience coming into law school. So the more experience you can demonstrate upon leaving law school, the better off you are. Um, I remember when I came into law school, the idea of taking a year off to do something in between college and law school, which I did, scared me to no end because I thought I'll graduate and I'll be a year older and everyone won't like me and I won't be a quality, you know, I won't be, a no, no. In fact, most employers like someone who's got more experience because they, they trust their maturity a little more. So don't be afraid to take the time off. Because, um, because this fellow did a six month placement with uh, the ICTR in Rwanda, he came back for the spring semester and did his spring semester here at Pitt. And then for his final semester, which he got an extra summer, so he was looking for an internship that he could do, and he found a placement with the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in DC. We have the DC semester program. So he lined up another six month internship at the High Commissioner's office in DC, started in June, worked through his second semester, or his, his final semester, did that down in DC, and now works for the UN High Commissioner because he had a year of experience working for an international organization before he graduated law school. And the moment he walked out of the door, he was an appealing candidate to them. Don't be afraid to take time off, to walk away from a semester and say, I'm going to spend a semester off doing all of this research, doing all of these skills, getting this experience, because it will make my candidacy better for the job that I want to go after. Don't do it just because you think it's a cool thing to do. Do it because you've done the research and you've looked at the job descriptions and they want that experience, and having that on your resume will make you stand out. But don't be afraid to take that time off and go and pursue that. All right. Um, these are the skill or these are the experience requirements on this job description. At least three years of work experience in one or more of the following fields: rule of law, governance, peace building, conflict prevention, and resolution. Demonstrated affinity with the mission and objectives of the Hague Institute. Throw away. Um, affinity again is a very broad word. If you see affinity in job descriptions, that's all good because it basically means oh, I can talk about how I once you know put a symposium issue together for the journal on rule of law topics, and that's affinity with the topic. Hooray. Um, track record of bi in building and developing relevant international networks. Now, this is an interesting one, and you're starting to see more of this where they're not, they're not hiring people just for what they know. They're hiring people for who they know as well. So this is where membership and professional associations, caveat, I work for one, um, like ASOL, represent a good opportunity for you to build a connection, to build contacts across a wide variety of practice areas. And then knowledge of and experience with international organizations and the international courts and tribunals located in The Hague. Um, both of these are, sorry, this last one and the first one are actually the real substance. They're where you need to drill down and say, do I have what I need to go after this job? And the reality is, the person that I was talking about, the, the law student who took a semester off, did a year or, yeah, did six months with the ICTR and then did six months with the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, I would tell him without a doubt, apply for this job. 
because the fact that he's a JD grad with international experience, some of it in country, uh, on the ground with a UN organization, and then some of it in DC with an international organization, does he hit the three years? No, he doesn't. Does that mean that he's not a qualified candidate for that job? Probably not, and it's worth trying. And that's gonna come back to one of the other things about jobs that we'll, uh, we'll talk about. There are a couple of golden rules that are true no matter what job you apply for. Job descriptions are m wish lists. They are not must-haves. Nobody writes a job description and assumes that they're gonna get every single thing that they asked for on that job description. It's impossible, and in fact, as an employer, I don't want someone who checks all of the boxes, because then I assume that I've got six months or so before they get bored and are willing to move on, because they actually know how to do everything in the job already. I want someone who's gonna grow into the job, who's gonna be challenged by it, but also has the skills that I need to get them up to that level. Always be applying for jobs slightly above your current level of skills and experience. You want to grow into a new job. Now this is for two reasons. One, like I said, most employers aren't expecting someone to check all of their boxes. They expect to have to train you up on certain things. And two, you need to be pushing yourself. And the reality about human life, especially post law school life, is you get a little complacent. You're like, oh, thank goodness, and there's not gonna be someone giving me an exam every three months to test whether or not I get to proceed with the rest of my life. I'm just gonna settle back a little bit, take advantage of the fact that I've got a regular paycheck and enjoy life. And you should do that. But when you're looking at your next job, don't be looking at something where you go, oh, I've got all of that now. Uh, yeah, I'll put in a job description. That sounds good. Be looking at something that's going to stretch you, something that's going to make you go, boy, you know what? Over the next six months, I'd better spend some time developing this set of skills or, or researching this particular area of international law or learning how to do policy work or learning how to work on the Hill or whatever it might be, because otherwise that job that I really want next, I'm not going to be qualified for, which is the unfortunate truth um, especially unless you're one of these rare lawyers in our generation and they're just non-existent anymore, they're, they're very, very few of them, that end up in the same place for 30 years. You're going to be moving jobs every four to six years. Um, in fact, if you work in the nonprofit NGO world, two years and two months is the average length of stay for a professional. Two years and two months. That means about six months after you get in the job, you're already developing your skill set for the next job that you're going after. All right? So, it's a constant process. Now, that may also help you decide to stay in place a little bit longer and learn a little bit more and get some experience on the ground before you take that next step, but it's something to keep in mind as you do that. Um, my nephew, who is now seven, almost seven, loves Pokemon, so the gotta catch them all comes from him. Um, you need to build your collection of job descriptions now. I don't care if you're, you're a first year, this is you're still learning how to do law school, let alone thinking about a job. You need to be collecting job descriptions, putting them in a folder. I actually recommend printing them out and highlighting some of these things and going through and saying, okay, this is what the job that I'm after, this is what they're looking for, this is what they want. Um, and I'm gonna learn the things that I need. I'm gonna take the classes and I'm gonna take the professors that are gonna give me the skills that or, or connect me with the institution to give me an internship that will give me the skills, then I need to qualify for that job. It is not a giant black box of mystery that you kind of throw resumes at and say, boy, I don't know. I hear all the time, I hear law students saying, I sent out 200 resumes and I haven't heard anything back. Well, yeah, because you're sending out 200 resumes that don't check any of the boxes that people are looking for. Send out 10 resumes that check all of the boxes that people are looking for and you're gonna get a much better response rate. It's gonna require more work from you, but you're gonna have much less stress in terms of, I don't know where my next job is gonna come from. Well, yes, you do. You've done the research for the last several years on where you want to end up. You know what they're hiring for or what their competitors are hiring for, and you have prepared yourself for that position. It doesn't have to be a guessing game. It can be something that you can approach with confidence, having developed the appropriate qualifications, skills, and experience in order to get that job. One more thing that we're gonna talk about, and we're gonna talk about it very fast because I wanna leave time for you guys to ask questions. Uh, networking. So, we had this thing down here, put your business cards in. Um, I see like three business cards. Um, I'm not gonna make you raise your hands. The university gives you business cards either for free or cheap. I forget which it is. Um, get them. Buy them. If, if you can't get one from the university, it's like 10 bucks to go get 250 from mailboxes or from Staples or office supply or whatever. Um, they are absolutely essential for developing a professional network. 
Um, there are a couple of rules about business cards. Uh, make sure you've got your full name on there, no nicknames. Um, now, it may be that you go by, like, I go by Wes. Wes is my middle name. So my business card is actually D. Wes Riss. So don't be afraid to put the name that you go by. If you go by your first name, you use your first name. If you go by your last name, you use your last name. But if you go by Bucky, don't put Bucky on your business card. Put whatever, I don't know what Bucky is short for, but put whatever Bucky is short for on the business card. Um, use, if you get the choice, if you use the university's, law, uh, the law school's business cards, fine, use them. But if you choose, if you get the choice, Use a personal email address. Don't use the school email address. That way you can continue using them after you graduate. All right? You want to have them available for as long as you possibly can until you can get someone else to pay for doing them and have a, a position on them. Um, and again, you wouldn't think I would have to say this, but make a job, make an email address just for your professional development work. First initial, middle initial, last name. First name dot last name, something like that. You would not believe the number of times I have received and promptly thrown away business cards in a professional networking association that says something like party all night or favorite dragon red or whatever else it might be. Put something professional. This is also true because you should just have a, an account, an email account that only is used for professional development. How many of us have oodles and oodles of things that we get in our regular Gmail or our Hotmail or whatever you've got that just comes in and you look at your email and you're like, oh my goodness, there's 75 new things just today. Have an account that the only thing that comes in there is professional communications. So when your mentor or your professional contact or the person that you're hoping can help you prepare for an interview emails you, you don't lose it in the 75 emails that you got that day. Um, have something that is your professional email. Happy hours and receptions are your best friend. Um, and not just because free booze and free food is great for a student, but because you want to be meeting people in a casual environment and happy hours and receptions are that exactly. It is really tough to find the time to follow up with someone after a formal substantive lecture. It's much easier to find the time to talk to someone at a happy hour reception and develop your professional contacts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We'll go through you know, these things. Um, here, this is what I want to talk about most because this is where people mess up. Everyone hates networking. Everyone's like, oh, I don't like networking. It feels fake. I feel like I'm a fraud. I'm, you know, just, I'm just after them because I want something from them and I don't care about this person. I don't care about what they do. Well, here's the thing. If you're talking to people who you, don't, you aren't interested in and you don't care about what they do and you only want the job from them, that's absolutely not what networking is. Of course you hate networking because you're doing it wrong. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Networking is very simply talking to people you cannot wait to talk to because you share their passion about the things that they are passionate about and you want advice from them on how you can end up where they are. If you approach networking with those steps, of course you're going to enjoy it more because you're not talking to people you couldn't care less about in an, in in an uncomfortable way to try and find how can I ask for a job. You're talking about people and you're basically saying, I love what you do and I want to be you in 10 years. How do I do that? And I guarantee you professionals, especially lawyers, um, professionals love to, re they respond to that and they can tell if you're genuine, which means you shouldn't be networking with everyone that comes in the door and not even everyone who is an international professional that comes in the door because some of them might be the right person and some of them aren't. I work for a professional membership association where our members care about everything. So I am a generalist now by trade. I have to know a little bit about everything. But my training is international human rights, humanitarian and international criminal law. That's what I'm passionate about. That's what I spend my volunteer time working on. That's what I care about. So when it comes down to who I'm going to talk to at a reception and I can talk to someone who's on an arbitration panel about a bilateral investment treaty for a, a, a propane gas plant in some country, or I can talk to, oh, I don't know, Tom Bergenthal, you know, pillar of international human rights. I'm going to talk to Tom Bergenthal. Um, that's what you do. You pick the people that you can go after. Now, a couple of things. One, know who you're going to talk to before you go to an event. Scout it. Don't go in just, oh, I think I might talk to this person or that person. Be deliberate about who you're going after. Most events, no more than two people. You're going to have two people that are really going to be relevant to what you're doing. Unless it's a panel that's absolutely on, you know, it's five people from the careers that you want for the rest of your life. Well, then, great problem to have. But most of the time, it's going to be very few people that you're going to be targeting. 
Have a question prepared in advance. Be prepared for the fact that they will probably answer your question during the presentation if they're doing some kind of substantive presentation. So be able, to, your lawyers, be able to think on your feet. Come up with a follow-up question. Demonstrate that you know. So don't be afraid to go up and say, what your name? Drew. Drew. So Drew, I loved what you talk about. I came in with this question about this. You answered my question. It made me think of this. What do you think about this? You have one question, 90 seconds to two minutes tops for networking. Don't be that person who stands there talking to the presenter for 10 minutes and no one else gets to talk to them. The presenter gets bored of that too and you also make the rest of the room unhappy with you. 90 seconds to two minutes top. Have one question, get an answer. That's really fascinating. I'd love to talk with you a little bit more about that. Could I give you my card and maybe follow up with you by email? You trade the business cards, you walk away. All right. One of the toughest things to do in networking is actually finding an exit strategy, which is why I always approach networking with an empty glass in my hand. Two reasons. One, when I'm done, I can say, really enjoy talking to you, Drew. I'm thirsty. I'm going to go refill my glass. Hope you have a wonderful night. It's an excuse. It's recognizable as an excuse, but no one cares because it's a believable excuse. Two, I'm also guaranteed not to spill anything on Drew, ruin his $3,000 suit, and destroy my international law career before it ever starts. So hooray for that, too. Um, you practice this, you get more experience with it. I strongly, we used to do, I don't know if they still do, but we used to do a networking reception for I think jurist in the LLMs, and we did one for International Law Society in the LLM students as well. They're both great opportunities to network with people who, not to put any of you down, but don't matter yet. I'm sure you will all be luminaries in international law in one day. But right now, if I spill water on Drew, nothing bad is going to happen, all right? To my career, at least. I remember the first time that I met a judge from the International Court of Justice, and I was absolutely convinced that the full glass of wine in my hand was going to end up on her blouse, and I was going to be barred from ever doing any international law ever again. Practice. Practice makes perfect. Practice in safe environments like networking opportunities here. So know who you're going after. Have a question prepared. Keep it short. Follow up after you're done with an email. And again, the intent here is to get a response. All right, you're trying to create an open avenue of communications. Don't approach them in the email after the event and say, will you be my mentor? They're going to run screaming from that because professionals are busy. They don't have the time to take on mentors. What you want to do is actually turn them into a mentor without them realizing it. And this is stealth mentoring. You, you know, you're going to be stealthy about how you do this. So you go to them with a very, very simple question because the goal is to get a response. Right? I want a question that when I email them, they can type an answer right then. When they receive it, when they see it for the first time, they don't go, oh, I have to go and look that up. I have to find out what the right answer to that is. They can go, oh, I know how to answer that, and boom. My go-to for this is, I really enjoyed what you talk about. Is there an article? Did you write something? Is there a book that you would recommend that I should read to learn more about this? And this is a favorite because, one, it gives them a chance to tout their own stuff, which they will always happily do. I just wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs for this. You should go read that. Great. Go read that. And two, it gives you a reason to automatically come back. Because then you come back after you read it and you say, I read that piece. It was wonderful. I would love to sit down and have coffee with you and talk about some of the things that I learned and some questions that I've got from that. Now you've given a reason for another piece of communication, another meeting. You're trying to develop a relationship. The goal here is two ways of communication. You want them responding to you and you always responding. And I, I will say this again. I know you'll hear it from career services. 24 hours is professional response time, especially if you're pursuing someone as a professional mentor. I'm terrible at the 24 hours right now because I'm preparing for a meeting of 1,200 lawyers from 100 different countries. And so I'm swamped in getting 70 emails a day. But if you are, as a student or a new professional, if you're pursuing a professional mentoring relationship, when that email comes in, within 24 hours, you have a response out. And a deliberate one, not a, uh, you know, oh, sure, that sounds great. Or, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. Have a deliberate response. Even if it is, I'm sorry, I have an exam tomorrow and I'm, I'm really booked on studying. I will revert back to you on Monday or something like that. That's fine. Just acknowledge that you got something from them. This is a potential mentor. They're taking time out to communicate with you. You don't want to lose this chance because you didn't get to that email in time. If you're going to be out of communications, put your out of office on. Out of office is important. Use it. Make sure you've got it. All right. Um, and then one of the last things, and then we'll switch to questions, and I know some of you might have to go for classes because we're at 1.30, but uh, make sure you're providing value. Um, and when I, mean that, when I say this, I mean you need to be giving them opportunities as well. And that can be difficult, but it also is a resource that you tend not to think about. You have 
this. You have space. You have a chance to invite people to give presentations. You can do it for your student organizations. You can do it for your journal. You can do it for Juris. You can do it for any other number of opportunities to give them a chance to come and talk because that's resume fodder for me. Now I get to go back home and write, oh, I gave a you know, professional development presentation at Pitt, you know, and that proves that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for my job. I can report about that. If it gets, shows up in the Pitt news or something, I can put a link to, my, on, to it on my website or my organization's website or whatever, right? So you have a resource, which is the university, that you can offer value to a professional contact. Now, don't be willy-nilly about it. Think about it. Use it intelligently, but you can use it. The other thing that is very valuable, which is because of the information age, because of the explosion of available resources, I do not read anywhere near the amount of stuff that I should be reading to stay up on the skills area that I care about. Now, this is something that you should grow over time as you get to know your professional contact. But if your professional, professional contact is really big on uh, international humanitarian law and responsibility to protect in Syria, and Pitt is going to host a seminar or a conference or is going to have a special speaker about that, let them know about it. If you read about a foreign policy article or Actually, no. Foreign policy is the wrong example. Um, if you read an article in a minor newspaper, in a smaller publication that they're unlikely to have read, something that they wouldn't see because they've got an RSS feed on Syria and responsibility to protect, then flag that. Bring that to their attention. I have a number of students who still communicate with me. They're graduated. They're long into good international careers. And they'll send me an article to read because they know what I care about. And I will read it because they flagged it to me. And that makes me think very positively of them. I may not have heard from them in a while, but they send me something, hey, I saw this, thought you'd be interested, you should take a look at it. And they know what I've got the time for. So 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 words, I can read that sitting at my computer right as they send it, that's value. Think about how you can provide value to the contact. You do that, you respond to them, you engage them, you be deliberate about it, you provide value, you're gonna turn them into a mentor without them even realizing it. The goal is when someone asks Drew, Drew, do you mentor anyone? And he goes to say, no, I don't mentor anyone. And then he's like, well, actually, I spend a lot of time talking to that West guy, and I really give him some advice about what he does. That, you know, okay, yeah, I actually do mentor someone. That's the reaction that you want. You don't want to walk up to them and say, will you be my mentor? You want them to realize one day they actually care. They're personally invested in what happens in your career. I know we have talked really fast. I know we've gone through a lot of stuff. Like I said, Austin will have these slides that he can pass on. Um, and that's pretty much it. Eileen, I'll have you pick a name real quick. So we'll draw for the, the book. Um, you have the flyer about the book is down here. Um, it is a collection of not just internships and fellowships at the end. It's got over 200 international internships and fellowships and writing competitions and moot court competitions. But it also has step-by-step -step instructions on a lot of what we talked about. It goes into a lot more detail. Um, there is a copy in the Career Guide office or in the Career Services office already. The library has a copy. Um, and then you, there's a flyer down here on you can order your own. Eileen, who is it? Ben Morrow. There you go. Um, I do not have to go anywhere, so I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, if you have to run off, by all means, um, drop a card or get my card from me. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to chat with you about uh, anything that you've got. So questions, folks that want to dive. Eileen, did you have something? 